Okay, can you see me? Can Practice see. mode only. Attendees cannot join until you broadcast. Broadcast. Okay, so now it looks like you can join that. Yep, I got you. Yeah, uh, so um, I mean, I could. Oh, okay, I see what we're looking at here. Chat, QA, raise hand. Now, without anybody else signed in, it's hard to tell what the interaction is going to look like. I can sign in from my laptop. That would help. Um, is that something we'll be doing during the? No, but if you just want to see what it looks like when there are a bunch of people here. What does that oh. look like on your screen? On my screen, I get a little notification that says Matt Schilbert raised his hand. Okay. And what can I do about that? Uh, Participants. You could address Matt Schilbert. Address me. <laughs> <laughs> address me. <laughs> Now that notification went away, so q and A. I I can ask a question, I can open a question here. Um, open. Right. Or I guess you could ask I, a question there. I, yeah. I can do a poll. I, oh, I can add a question. I don't really know what I'm saying, but No, I mean, it seems to be working. It's hard to tell what's actually going to happen until um, the analysts show up and then we see how the layout looks. I, on my screen, as a participant, I could see Kelsey just fine. And um, I'm able to ask questions and raise my hand. Uh, virtually raise hand, virtually ask questions. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, no, I appreciate, appreciate you checking in. Uh, it looks like it's going to be fine. Um, if anything goes wrong, I guess I'll just curse your name silently because it doesn't really help. Yes, yesterday I'm free. Awesome. All right. All right, cool. Thank you all for doing this. And uh, yeah, have fun. All right, talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Uh, so it's, it looks like it's recording right now. Yeah? Yeah. I don't know if there's a way on your screen to stop recording or if we just got to record for the next hour. And it does seem that we are recording. Uh, how did my question, I can stop it. How did my question come up on your screen? Oh, there's a little, I got a little thing here. How do you get your hair so permanent? <laughs> I can answer live. Oh, and that would mean that I answer it like this, or I could right. type out an answer to you. Oh, no. You know what's probably going to happen? Is that's going to be the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can say done, and it just made it go away. So uh, that question's done now. Uh, in the Q&A box. It still shows up. Well, in my Q&A box, it doesn't. Close down you your Q&A box and reopen ask. it. Okay. Ask. Does it still show up if you close it and reopen it? It does for me. It says, <laughs> it says you ask. Okay. Well, when you reopen the Q&A? No, it's gone now. <laughs> Sorry, it was a relatively benign question. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> should I pause the recording right now? I can pause it or stop it. Uh, let's All right. Great. Well, maybe we can just start off with a couple of introductions. Amber and Corey, do you guys want to introduce yourselves, the Grantwood AEA, and also sort of your background in like coding or robotics or anything? Like what do you do either with Hummingbird or not with Hummingbird? 
Absolutely. Sounds good. <laughs> so my name is Amber Bridge and I'm a digital learning consultant at Grantwood AEA. Um, my background uh, starting at the agency was about five years ago and they said, hey, we're going to start a makerspace. And I said, I don't know what a makerspace is. <laughs> but then I went to learn. I'm like, oh, that's exactly what I had in my science classroom. So I taught science for 10 years and just having and being able to learn more about how some high tech tools uh, can be used in ways to really fuel students creativity has been awesome for me to learn about. Mm -hmm. And I would say within the last year, maybe year and a half, my learning around Hummingbird has accelerated. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was a little frustrated with it at first, but holy buckets, now I am on Team Hummingbird. I <laughs> think that it is a great tool to be able to have people create with. and. It's just been so much fun. Cool. How about you, Corey? Hi. I'm Corey Rogers. I'm also a digital learning consultant at Grant Wood. Um, I have a computer science degree. So I taught STEM and computer science in the suburbs of Detroit to middle schoolers for a long time. Um, but what I would say is that I'm really in love with the physical computing stuff. And I feel like Hummingbird is a great way to do that. Amber and I were super jazzed with the new version that has the micro bit so that yes. kids can actually see the output of the sensor, mm -hmm. teachers do, but um, we just feel like it really makes it so that kids um, can debug and be thoughtful about their code. Yes. Um, and so Grant Wood is in Southeast, uh, no, I always do this wrong, Southeast Iowa. I'm new yes. to Grant Wood. <laughs> um, so we're in Southeast Iowa. We serve 32 school districts. Mm -hmm. What else do you want to say? Yeah, basically, if you kind of think about Cedar Rapids as being on that eastern side of the state and you draw a big circle around it, we serve all of those school districts <laughs> <All right>. around there. <laughs> um, Bridget is from uh, RAA, uh, so is Deanne. And yeah, it's, it's great to be able to work and interact with teachers and offer all sorts of different opportunities to be able to uh, support them in their learning around it. Great. Well, I'll introduce myself as well. Is my big reveal. I'm coming to you from our live stream learning studio in the basement of Bird Brain Technologies in Pittsburgh. And although I am Iowa born and raised, I was just talking to Amber and Corey. I'm, I'm from West Des Moines originally. Went to Valley. Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I grew up, grew up there, went to UNI for college. Um, but now I live in Pittsburgh. Um, and I came out here when my, my husband was going to grad school here. And so I work for Bird Brain Technologies now, and my background, I'm actually a certified English teacher for middle and high school, not coding and robotics. But um, I got into coding and robotics because I was teaching an after-school program, and I was teaching this after-school program that was um, for fourth through eighth grade girls only here in Pittsburgh, and it was for um, uh, inner city, you know, inner city Pittsburgh girls here. And the way that this got introduced to me was not in sort of a, a friendly setting like this. My administrator at the time dropped a gallon sized baggie of what appeared to be wires, but what I later learned was a hummingbird kit on my desk and said, by the way, you're doing robots next week. And I was like, oh, I don't know how to do that. Uh, is there, are you sending me to a training or something like that? And she was like, oh no, you have the internet. And I was like, Okay. All right. Okay. We got this. So I don't know if anybody here has done anything with code.org before, um, but I really love that resource. It's a great free resource for teachers who are interested in computer science and robotics. Um, and uh, there's all sorts of free lesson plans and even like unplugged things for when your Wi-Fi goes out at your school. And uh, so that was my first introduction to coding was doing code.org lessons five years ago. And they don't call teachers teachers. They call them lead learners. And I really like that term. Um, and encourages that sort of like guide from the side mentality. And um, it was really true for me that first year because my girls, my fourth graders would go, all right, uh, how do you do this? And I'd be like, I, I don't know. Let's try it together. <laughs> yeah. I don't that know. is the maker mentality right, right there. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So um, uh, I'll have uh, Matt, who's, uh, he's here with me in Pittsburgh. He and I work together at Bird Brand. I'll have him be periodically sharing that Google Doc throughout our time together, just in case anybody joins late. Because um, as it turns out, if you're not in the video call when something gets shared, 
you can't see it. So he'll be sharing that periodically. But if you haven't yet, go ahead and open up that Google Doc because it's got a bunch of really cool resources. And if you missed it at any point, he'll share it again every few minutes or so. Um, but in that Google Doc, I want to do a little icebreaker. So I don't know if anybody here has used Menti before, but just like on your smartphone or on your computer, if you go to menti.com um, and you type in those numbers, um, you should have a question pop up. And the, the question, oh, actually, let me edit the question slightly. Not about makerspaces. I want it to be about coding and robotics. There we go. There we go. OK, so now I'll present. So um, if you go to menti.com and you enter those numbers, you should get the question, why are you interested in coding and robotics? And um, there's, I think, seven different options there. There's one about economic and workforce development, citizenship and civic engagement, competencies and literacies. You can read through those a little bit. But once everybody's gotten to menti.com and you've entered in those numbers, I'll split my screen like so and shrink this down a little bit so y'all can see it. There we go. And so th those numbers are up on the top here as well, but we can see why everybody's interested in coding and robotics. And I love menti.com because these, these things come in live. I think this is a really cool way to be engaged, especially because we're coming from as far away as Norwalk, Iowa. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, interesting. So there's a, a, a good chunk of people really interested in personal agency, joy, and fulfillment, um, school reform and improvement, and technological, social, and scientific innovation. Really interesting. Um, would anybody like to unmute themselves and share why they chose one of the things they chose? Competencies and literacies is creeping up there too. Would anybody like to share why did you choose that thing that you chose? You can unmute yourself and share with us. Yep, we'll post the Google Doc again for you. There you go. Oh, are you thinking maybe you can't unmute? It would be in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. This is the first time we've done a Zoom link exactly like this, so that may not be possible, but all right. Well, um, maybe I know Amber and Corey, you guys can talk. So what were some of your answers that you two put in and why, why did you put that in? Um, I chose personal agency, joy. Um, one of the things that I get to do at Grant Wood is we get to highlight student makers and student creators. And with that, we use the hashtag have fun making. And for me, that's kind of a big message of making is very personal. It's very connected and it really kind of brings you alive. And so that personal agency joy piece is a big one for me because I want kids in our schools to feel alive and to feel creative and to be having fun. So I marked that one, but another one that I marked <laughs> um, was the equity and social justice. Um, way back when I went to college, there were very few women in the computer science department and in the math department for that matter. Um, and so I just feel really strongly about that equity piece um, for underrepresented groups. Women, it happens to be one I'm really passionate about is making sure that all kids see themselves in creative robotics or computer science or problem solving, whatever frame you put that in, but that um, they all see themselves and find a place. Yeah. So I like to ask this question in the, the workshops that I do. So what I do for BirdBrain, I guess I should have mentioned that a little bit. What I do for BirdBrain is I primarily teach teachers coding and robotics. And so I teach a lot of teachers like me who do not have a background in computer science or robotics. Um, and I, I try to make it really comfortable and friendly for them to um, be able to access that. Um, so uh, uh, as I mentioned, my background is not in coding and robotics, but I have a, quite a few years of experience in it now. And it's interesting when you think about, well, what, what teachers are qualified to teach computer science and robotics? As of like 2016, I think in the year 2016, only 17 people graduated from college with a computer science teaching degree in the entire United States. So like there are 17 people qualified to do what we're all interested in doing. So I, I actually find that really empower, uh, empowering because like, Nobody knows what they're doing. We are all making it up, which I, I really appreciate. Um, <clears throat> so, but I think it's important to, to tap into your why reason. Why are you interested in this? Is it because you think it looks fun? Is it because of that equity piece? Is it because you're, uh, you're, um, that you've got some anxieties around the future of work 
or something like that, I think it's important to ask yourself honestly and to continue asking yourself that question because that's gonna affect how you teach it and how you present it to students. Um, so we'll come back to that question at the end as well and we might resubmit our answers to see kind of how our, our thoughts have changed. I have another way to do that. So if we have time, we'll come back to that. Um, but, here we go. So we've talked a little bit about, um, you know, why you might be interested in coding and robotics. Um, but now I think it's useful at this point to talk about what a robot actually is. So let's take a look at the Hummingbird as an example of a robot. Now there are all kinds of different robotics tools, but I think the Hummingbird is a, a really cool one. It's the one that I chose to put in my classroom five years ago, and then I ended up coming and working for the company. Um, but get rid of Menti there. So this is what the Hummingbird Robotics Kit looks like. And if you open it up, you'll see there's all kinds of like stuff in there. And although this is much better organized than a gallon sized baggie, which is what I was presented <laughs> with, this still kind of looks like a bunch of wires and like stuff. We'll get into what these things actually are later. But first let's talk about what a robot actually is. So a robot is something that senses, thinks, and acts. So when we say sensing, that means that it gathers data from the environment somehow. And so in the Hummingbird, you've got either two or four sensors that come with the kit, depending on the size of kit that you get. So there's a dial sensor that you can use sort of like a volume knob. There's a distance sensor, which can sense how far things are away from the sensor itself. There's a light sensor that can sense the amount of light in the room. And then there's a sound sensor. So your kit comes with those four things. You can choose to use one or all of them or none of them in your creative robot, whatever you make. The thinking happens on the hummingbird and the micro bit. And I'll talk a little bit more about what the difference is between those two tools in just a second. They're two separate things that we sort of smush together so that you can use the capabilities of both of them together. But that's where the thinking happens. The, the robot will take in that information and then we'll do something with it. Well, what does it do? Well, you can use lights, which plug into the hummingbird, or you can use motors. And so that's the outputs. Those are the things that it does. So I think um, it can be kind of hard to, to have a definition for a robot because you know one when you see one, you're like, yep, that's a robot. It's a Roomba, it's a robot, got it. But there are some <laughs> things that you, you, you know it when you see it, but it can be kind of hard to have a definition. So I think having a definition of sense, think, act, just breaking it down into those three parts is really cool. And the thing that's really cool about Hummingbird for me is like a lot of robotic tools out, robotics tools out there, they have outputs and they have a brain. Not all of them have sensor capabilities, which for me makes it not a true robot, makes it into more of a toy, a programmable toy at that point, because it's just thinking and acting. But hey, we got another participant, welcome in. Um, but uh, uh, a lot of, of robotics tools out there, they um, house these things in an already existing body, like a plastic body or a, an, an existing little thing. It's already a thing. Um, but what you can do with a hummingbird is you can make your robot into anything using just regular craft supplies. So I've got all of these robots behind me kind of beeping and booping and hanging out. And <laughs> these are all inspired. So What's that? <laughs> it's so fun it's to watch so behind fun. you. <laughs> so fun. We actually we had to unplug a couple of them because they were like too interesting, <laughs> especially right. He's real talkative, so we gotta, gotta calm it down. Um, but so I'm gonna take some of these down and show you them more in depth a little bit later. But all of the projects that you've seen behind me were inspired by actual classroom projects. And we're gonna take a, a look at some examples of classroom projects that teachers have done with their fourth graders, their eighth graders, their 12th graders in English class, in social studies class, in math class to teach English standards and social studies standards and math standards with creative robotics. So um, to, uh, uh, to think about that a little bit, like why, why that approach? So my, uh, my reason for teaching robotics, what makes me really passionate is equity. And that's one of the big reasons that BirdBrain was started as well. BirdBrain came out of Carnegie Mellon University here at, at Pittsburgh, um, out of this lab called the CREATE Lab. And I don't remember what all of the letters in CREATE stands for, but I remember the E is equity. Um, so, the, the question, the research question that Tom, Dr. Tom Lowers, who started Bird Brain, um, he was asking when he was a PhD student was, how do we engage more girls in coding? 
And he found that if you affected three things, they, they kind of messed with a bunch of different variables, but the three variables that had the biggest impact on whether or not girls would engage in coding were, number one, make it physical. So take the code off the screen and put it into the actual world, i.e. robotics. Sometimes people will say physical computing. It's robotics. So that was part one. Part two was give girls meaningful creative choices. Making it pink is not a meaningful creative choice to a girl. It's a creative choice, but it's not like a meaningful one, right? But like, let's make a robot petting zoo. What animal do you want to make? That's a meaningful creative choice. What will you make it out of? Will it be fuzzy or not fuzzy? How will it move? Will it have a sensor? What sensor? Will it move when you feed it with a, a light sensor in its mouth? Will it have a distance sensor on its head so that when you pet it, it'll do something? How will your robot petting zoo animal work? And sure, do you wanna make a pink unicorn? Do it, right? So <laughs> make it physical, give them actual meaningful creative choices. And then the third piece was the reason that we made Hummingbird compatible with craft supplies is that we found that the building supplies that you give students actually matters to their engagement with the task. So if you gave them a bunch of unfamiliar stuff that looked kind of technical or expensive, I noticed this, I don't know if you guys see this with your students, have you ever had a student like you put craft supplies out and they'll go, can I take these two pipe cleaners home? Mm -hmm. Which like breaks my heart a little bit because that means they don't have access to those at home and they don't think that they right. could ask their parents to buy those for them and that they would have access, but they know what a pipe cleaner is and they want to use it, right? So, but if you, if you put out a bunch of stuff that they don't know what that is, then they don't really know how to interact with it. But if you put out craft sticks and pipe cleaners and hot glue guns and um, cardboard and some scissors, like they know how to work that. Furthermore, thinking about girls, I wanna show you this guy. I'll come back to this one later when we talk about mechanisms. But this hand is made out of friendship bracelet string and straws and some cardboard. So let me switch my view here so I can show it to you from the top. You can take a look at it. It's just got string and straws. I have a lot of teachers come up to me when I put this out at the booth and they go, oh, we do that hand project in my science class. We make a hand, but we just pull on the strings. You mean I can put motors on them? Absolutely, let's take a look inside of it. Actually, I'll save it. You can wonder how it works because we're gonna come back <laughs> and talk about mechanisms get hyped, basically. So, um, so uh, if you wanna engage, the original question was around girls, but I found that that holds true with all kinds of under-engaged groups. So um, there are five sort of groups of students who are really historically under-engaged in STEM and STEAM. Girls, students of color, students of low socioeconomic status, rural students, and students with learning exceptionalities. People think robots are only for the smart kids. Robots are only for the city kids. Robots are only for white kids. Robots are only for boys, right? Robots are, are only for, mm -mm, they're for everybody. If you make it physical, if you give them meaningful creative choices that they actually care about, and if you give them craft supplies that they are familiar with. The added bonus of using craft supplies, by the way, is that they're cheap. So mm -hmm. you don't have to keep coming back to us, the company, to order this other little part or whatever. Go get more stuff from Amazon. Or better yet, what I used to do is I would have my students bring in their recyclable materials for like two or three weeks and then we had building materials forever and that gave them so much ownership over that too because they would go that's my kleenex box you're using for your bunny or like that's my <laughs> detergent bottle and they just like got jazzed about it they were really excited about it um, we've even seen in some of our area schools like they'll have like a little uh, box at the welcome desk where the secretary's at we're collecting this this month and then everyone just throws in their little toppers from their um, applesauce packets or their <laughs> whatever it is that they're trying to collect and make with. Uh, that's awesome. That is that is exactly what I would do. I would always have to specify clean milk jugs though. I got one <laughs> rancid milk jug and that's really all you need to never have that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, so um, when you're using your hummingbird, I'm gonna show you how to program and build a little bit with it. I'm gonna show you how to blink some LEDs and build some stuff with LEDs and hopefully we'll also get to motors as well. So I can show you how to program and um, code a motor. And I'm gonna be doing that with an iPad. Um, you can code your, if you've got a hummingbird, you can code it with a, a laptop, like a Windows or a Mac laptop. You could code it with a, um, a tablet of any kind, whether it's an iPad or like, a Kindle Fire, or even a smartphone, um, or even a Chromebook, if you've got Chromebooks at your school. 
or even a Linux machine if you know you're. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to show it to you on an iPad just because I, I like the interaction that it has for teaching. It's a really quick interaction. But uh, we like to say that the Hummingbird is device agnostic, meaning that you can use whatever device you have in your school and you don't have to buy any extra little doodads to snap onto it to make it work. It just works. The new version of the Hummingbird does anyway. Um, so I'm going to switch to this view here and we'll take a look at, um, oh, before I get to that, actually, I have one other thing that I want to do is just like identify some of the parts and pieces that we're gonna be working with today. Um, so if I start moving some stuff over, we've got our hummingbird, that's the, the part of the controller there. We've got our micro bit right here. Turn that so it doesn't have glare on it, there we go. We're gonna be using a um, battery pack here. This just needs like four AA batteries. So put that in there. You can use rechargeable ones if you want. I just get cheap ones from the Dollar Tree. Um, and then if you were programming with a computer, you'd need a USB cord. It comes with the kit. And then you'll want this little orange thing. It's a terminal tool that helps you kind of press down the buttons so you can plug stuff in. So I'm let so me glad you shared the actual name of that. <laughs> yeah, I used to just call it a poke and stick, which I think is a completely valid name. But I call it a terminal I think, tool. Yeah, I think we call it the orange toothpick. Yeah. Too. The orange toothpick works as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, so just to talk about the hummingbird versus the micro bit a little bit, I don't know if any of you guys have heard of this before, but the micro bit is a super powerful little computer science tool. Um, if you think about, this is a type of microcontroller. And so there are other types of microcontrollers like an Arduino is an example, your computer has a microcontroller in it. Um, the main difference between a micro bit and something like an Arduino is that the micro bit was made for education. It was made for educators. So about 15 years ago, the Arduino came out. It's really cheap, um, but it was made for like basement enthusiasts. It made it cheap enough for people in their basements to start tinkering around with robotics, which is cool. But for teachers, we don't, we want something you can tinker with, but like with an Arduino, if you plug stuff in wrong, you can blow out the board and like fires in school, not optimal. So uh, we don't make this thing. If you look on the back here, it says BBC. The BBC Foundation invented these, so these came out of London. We just like them and use them. Um, so this has at least a semester's worth of really high quality computer science curriculum that goes with it. The Microbit company has that on their website, and this thing is 15 bucks. It's really cheap. It's a super powerful little tool. It's got these A and B buttons you can use as inputs. All these little white things, those are LEDs. So that's like an LED array. You can like draw shapes on it. You can um, get words to scroll across the screen, stuff like that. It's got all kinds of cool capabilities like an accelerometer, a compass, radio function. We'll get into what those are later. But if you want to get into robotics with it, it's got this gold thing on the bottom. These are ports. There are four ports down there. So if you wanted to attach an LED, you could do that with like alligator clips. Um, if you wanted to attach a motor, you'd most likely need to put like a shield in between the board and the motor because if it's a five volt motor, it's only a three volt board and you got to put a shield in there and like that gets fussy quick. So what we did is we made it so that you could snap your micro bit into your hummingbird. And so now instead of just four ports that are kind of fussy, now you've got two tricolor ports. See, it says tricolor there and it says one and two. So there's two tricolor LED ports. You can put two tricolor LEDs in. Three single color LED ports. Four motor ports here along the side. And three sensor ports along the bottom. So that's 12 things that you can plug into the same project. So we like to talk about the Hummingbird as having a low floor, meaning it's really easy to get started, but also a high ceiling. And we're gonna talk about a bunch of ways in which it has a high ceiling, not only in the coding, but in the building, in the amount of components you can use. When you get into some more advanced things like radio function, you can sync up multiple hummingbirds on the same network. And now you've got, instead of four motors, you can do 12. Like you can get, whoa, you don't have to start there, right? You can start with a single light and a single motor and make something really fun and engaging in a really easy way where it doesn't take you 15 minutes to hook everything up. So that's what I'm going to show you how to do today. We're going to do a light and a motor, and I'm going to show you a funky little project that you can do with that light and motor. So first things first, let's plug in our LED. So I'm going to get my battery pack. I'm going to scooch that stuff off to the side there. I'm going to get my battery pack, and I am going to zoom in just slightly. Oop, that's zooming out. Zooming in. 
So you can kind of see what I'm doing and you can see how easy it is to program and plug that in. So I'm gonna plug in my battery pack like so. And I'm gonna turn it off for now to conserve battery. And I'm gonna get, your kit comes with three single color LEDs. Comes with a red, a green, and a yellow LED. And so I'm gonna get my favorite color, which is green today, I just decided. <laughs> and I'm gonna plug that guy in. There we go. So you know it's a green LED because it's got a green and a black wire on it. And we're gonna plug it in right where it says LEDs and it says one, two, and three. We're gonna plug it in right where it says one. And if I bring this a little closer, you can see that it says positive and negative there. So the black wire is your ground wire and it always corresponds to that negative thing. So I'm gonna be plugging my black wire in here and my green wire in here. Now you can just use your fingernails if you want. I just cut my fingernails, so I'm gonna use this terminal tool. And actually little people's fingers are a little bit better at doing this than ours is. But the way that you plug in your wire is you press down the button, you insert the wire at about a 45 degree angle, you let it go, and it's pinched in there. Press down the button, insert the wire, and let it go, there you go. So now you've got a really nice secure connection. If you're using alligator clips, those things can like fall off. There's nothing more frustrating than building an awesome project and somebody bumps it and now your light doesn't work and you're like, why, why? And it's because something got loose and it's like, ah. So this avoids some of that frustration. So there we go, we've got a single LED plugged in. I'm gonna go ahead and turn on my battery pack and zoom out just to skosh so that y'all can see my iPad here. There we go. So you can see my hummingbird, you can see the LED, which I've got up there, and you can see my iPad. Zoom in just a little bit so you can see, there we go. All right, so here's how you connect your, um, uh, your, your hummingbird to an iPad. Now I'll put it like this so you can see, it's flashing some stuff on the micro bit. It's kind of hard to see via video, but it's flashing the letters FSC. So if I open up bird blocks, oops. There we go. Bird Blocks. So it's a free app. You could put this on your phone right now if you wanted to um, and follow along if you wanted to do that. Um, but I'm going to show you kind of how to program here. So I'm going to make a new program and I'm going to call it Iowa because that's who we are today. Yes. <laughs> and um, scooch that up a little bit so I don't get glare. There we go. And the way you connect it, so um, I'm not sure how comfortable or familiar everybody here is with coding in robotics, but just to talk a little bit about the language that we're gonna be using, this language is called Bird Blocks, but the Hummingbird works with a bunch of different programming languages. It works with Bird Blocks, which is our free app that we invented. It also works with Make Code, which is an online programming language. It works with um, Snap. Um, it works with Java and Python as well. Um, so depending on whether you're a third grader or a 12th grader, if you're in an English class or a computer science class, it's not only device agnostic, but it's pretty language agnostic as well. Um, so uh, if you've never done anything with block-based coding before, just to talk to you about what this is, as I click on these different things over here, these are all different folders full of blocks. I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see them better. So there's an operators one, a sound, tablet, control, variables. They're all different kinds of blocks. They're different colors and they're different shapes and they have different functions. And I really love block-based coding because color and shape matter, which is great because like we spent the first few years of our lives learning how to identify colors and shapes and that's finally paying off as adults, right? So if I go into robots, there's no blocks there yet and it's because I haven't connected to my hummingbird. So I'll show you how to do that. Hit this little hummingbird connection block and you say connect device. And then it's going to show all of the hummingbirds that are in Bluetooth mode that are around me right now. This one is called Floppy Sky Chicken. They all have random three word names. Uh, they're all like two adjectives and an animal. So this one is Floppy Sky Chicken, which corresponds to FSC, which is on this device. So that's how you know if you've got a 20 of these in a classroom, that's how you know your, your students know which one they're connecting to. So I'll grab that Can one. You, uh, change the names of them, just as a random question. No, nope, you can't. They're um, just assigned in the, um, at the warehouse. So they're randomly assigned. They're all funny and there's no inappropriate ones because there was a really funny week at work where we had a long um, Excel sheet with all of the inappropriate combinations of three letters. Sure. Yeah. Great work week. Um, so there aren't any of those that will pop up for you. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've had a few educators that have run into like other robotics where you can rename them. Um, 
and then students rename them. So yeah. that was uh, what I was curious about. Very creative, and we really want to encourage that creativity, but not yes. Right. Yes. <laughs> harness it in a good way. Yes. So now you see the, the robot blocks appeared because now I'm connected to a robot. Um, so uh, the way that block-based coding works is that you grab a block from over here, you drag it into this gray space, and I'm actually going to zoom in so you can see that block really big. So I dragged out a block that said bit LED one at 0%. That's all right. We should make it. Bit LED one at 0%. Actually, I can plug him in so that he doesn't die. Um, uh, let me switch it around here. Don't want my iPad to die while we're programming here. There we go. So um, bit refers to the, oops refers to the type of uh, hummingbird that we have plugged in. The old version is called the Duo, so you know that this one is, uh, oops, cancel, there we go. All right, so uh, the LED is the component that we're working with, which is a single color LED. The one is the port that we're plugged into, and we're plugged into port one, and the 0% is the brightness, so what do you think we'd have to set it at to turn the light on all the way? Probably 100%, so if I type 100 in there, it's not working yet, my light hasn't come on, that's because I need to click the block. Ta-da, hey, look at there, my light came on. So that's how easy it is to turn a light on. You don't have to, you don't have to find the pin or really, like it's just super easy to read that block. So oftentimes during a workshop, I'll ask teachers like, metacognitive moment, how does it feel to turn on your light? And a lot of times <laughs> they're like, wow, that was a lot easier than I thought it'd be. Yeah, man, super fun, super easy. So if I want to turn it off, there's two ways to do that. Either I could hit the red stop sign in the upper right-hand corner of my um, thing, and that stops all your programs that, they're, that it's running. Or I could drag out another one, leave it at 0%, and turn it off like that. Now, if I click back and forth, I'm blinking a light. Yeah, man. So it's on and then off, and then on and then off. And that's a cool way to blink a light, but robotics is all about automation, so let's automate that a little bit. The thing about block-based coding is the reason that it's shaped like that with those little puzzle pieces, so you can snap those together. And now it's going to read this whole line of blocks. So watch what happens when I click it. My green light hops on for just a fraction of a second, and then it goes off. Can you guys see it blinking okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So every time I click it, it goes on to 100%, off to 0%, and then it stops because the program's over. When the book's done, you stop reading it, right? So it stopped reading our script. Let's say we want it to run that script over and over and over again. The way we do that, we'd go into our control blocks. These control how the blocks run. And I grab one that says repeat forever, like so. And I'm gonna put it out in the middle of nowhere. And I love that you can tell kind of how this works by the shape. It's got this little tail with gray space in it. So I know that I can put stuff inside there. So I'm gonna bring this LED block down now it just opened up for it there. And now if I run it, it'll glow white and look at there. It's running that program on, off, repeat, on, off, repeat. It's running it really fast. So that actually represents the speed of the Bluetooth connection. And this is an iPad, so it's got pretty good Bluetooth capabilities. When people use this on like older model phones, it's a little slower, but hey, it's still, it's blinking, right? But let's say this is like blinking too fast. It's gonna give us a conniption. Let's <laughs> slow it down a little bit. We can do that with weight blocks. So I can put a weight block in between those two, and then another one afterward. Zoom out a little bit so you can see it. So now, the way that this program is reading, it's going on to 100%, and then the computer, or the hummingbird, is waiting one second before it moves on to the next block of 0%, and then it's waiting for a second before it repeats it. So if I were gonna off here, on here, off here, on here, off here. It wants to go like right down the line, but that weight block makes it stop. For you math teachers out there, you can get into some decimals here. Let's have it wait for just half a second. Now it's blinking on and off every half a second. So why does math matter? For some students, no matter what you put on a worksheet, they're not going to think math is cool. But this is pretty cool. This is like a fun reason to care about decimals. Um, so it can be really, really easy to program, but this workshop is all about creative robotics in the classroom. So. The thing about Hummingbird is there, I mean, like you can code all kinds of different robots to blink a light. The thing about Hummingbird is you can make it into something now. So I'm going to clear this stuff off to the side for a second and we're going to make something. I've got 
a cutting board because safety. Uh, I've got a box cutter because fun. And um, I've got a piece of cardboard here. There we go. So um, all of the things that I'm showing you exist on our website, and I'm going to show you where to find them near the end of the webinar today. Um, but this is one of my favorite little hacks about how to mount an LED onto a project. Um, so if I take my X-Acto knife and I cut a little X in my cardboard, like so, there we go. I'm going to use my terminal tool to just sort of poke through there a little bit. Great. Now here's what I'm going to do with my hummingbird. I'm actually going to disconnect the LED from here by just put, pressing down the buttons and pulling out the wires. And then I'm going to thread my, my LED through wires first, like so. And then when I pull it through the cardboard, it's going to make this nice LED mount. A lot of times people will try to like smush an LED in from the back or use a hole puncher or something. Just cutting an X and it holds it in there really snugly. And now my, my um, iPad is still running that same code. So as once I get both wires connected, my LED will begin to blink again. And I'll move it so you can see right when it starts up again. I'm going to plug that wire in and this wire in. There we go. So now it's blinking every half second again, and it's mounted really securely. So this is like almost a project. This is almost interesting to me. It's like right on the edge of being interesting to me. <laughs> what I want to do now is like, I want to make it into something. I want to do something funky with it. So I'm going to grab a couple uh, Sharpies. I'm going to make what this reminds me of, especially where I've, I've mounted it. It reminds me of a Cyclops. So I'm going to make just the cutest little Shrek you ever did see. There he is. I'm gonna give him a shirt and some pants. Mm -hmm. There we go. Some pants because this is a school. Okay. <laughs> pants are good. Yeah. There we go. Da, 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 da. All right. And I'm gonna draw a little bit around him. He's sort of a, a Shrek Mike Wazowski hybrid. <laughs> there you go. So now it's a thing, right? I just made it into a thing. This could be, oh, I forgot a foot. There. Um, I'm a perfectionist, as you can tell. <laughs> the most beautiful ogre anyone's ever seen in their lives. Um, but as you can see, like it doesn't take a whole lot to turn a blinking light into a project. This could be a first day of school self-portrait and you put two lights in there, or you use tricolor LEDs and you get students to try and make their, their eyes blink or whatever. Like this is a very simple five minutes to learn how to code it. I don't know, we could call that five minutes, but even sure, that was a minute and a half to make a self-portrait. Um, yeah, so it's kind of funny that you brought that up because Corey and I made uh, portraits just today to use on a Flipgrid introduction with other people across the state. Did, so. uh, with hummingbirds? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. We were there. We were, we were cosmically connected somehow. I just, yes. <laughs> um, cool. So just check in time here. Um, we've got about 20 minutes left and thinking about what I still want to cover and make sure you guys know how to do. I want to do things with motors really quick. And I'm just going to kind of show you how to program a motor and how easy that is. And then I want to show you a bunch of projects because that's what we came here for. We came for creative robotics in the classroom. Um, so to uh, amp this up a little bit, I am going to grab a motor here, and I'm going to, this one is a positional servo motor. Here's how you plug it in. It's way easier than an LED. See where it says positional servo motor port one? You just smush it in there, and now that guy's ready to go. And I'm going to grab one of these. This is called a servo horn, and there are a bunch of different shapes on here. Um, you can pick your favorite shape. I'm going to pick this windmill shape because you can see it move real easy, like so. There we go. And um, now I'm going to put that over here, right there, so you can see it move. All right, and then I'm going to program it. So this is going to be really easy to program because it's going to be basically just like what I just did for an LED. I'm going to scooch that code off to the side. The positional servo, I'm going to tell it to go to 90 degrees. I'm going to turn it, let's see, is there a way that you can see it better? There, that's a little better. So if I click it once, it goes to 90 degrees. And if I click it again, it doesn't move because it's already at 90 degrees. The way that a positional servo motor works 
is like a protractor. It goes from zero to 180 degrees, and you tell it to go to an angle, and that's a static angle. It'll stay there until you tell it to go somewhere else. So it already went to 90 degrees. If I want it to go somewhere else, I could tell it to go to 180 degrees. There we go. If I click that, it'll move. 90, 180, 90, 180. And if I want it to do that over and over again, I can bring those things together. Put them all in a repeat loop, a little bit of pattern recognition for those of us interested in computational science. And now every second, it's gonna go back and forth. Super easy to program a motor. Let me show you why lights and motors are really cool. Let me show you some classroom projects. So I'm gonna clear this out of here. I'm gonna clear my space so you can see it a little better. Sort of shove things up there. Let me show you a couple of cool projects. So this one right here has a couple lights and a motor. Here we go. I'll zoom out a little bit so you can see them a little better. This one was invented by a health teacher uh, right outside Pittsburgh here. His name is Brett Slezak. And um, he was, he's a health teacher who was interested in his students understanding how muscles and bones worked together. That the bones move, but they don't move themselves. They are moved by muscles. And so each group got a different joint that they had to model. And in the original version, they had to label all of the bones, they had to label the muscles, et cetera. But this is just one motor mounted up there, going back and forth from like 30 to 60 degrees or something. And as each muscle is activated, the light lights up. So they didn't just label a picture of a, of a joint, they made it. And they understood how it worked, that as this muscle gets shorter, that one gets longer. As your bicep contracts, your tricep lengthens, and vice versa, as your tricep contracts, your bicep lengthens. So they understood so many concepts by building this one project. Um, and that is a project, I'm gonna show you where to find that on our website too. Really cool, you could be doing robots in gym class or in health class to make the things that you wanna do move. I'm also gonna show you one that I'm really proud of um, because I, this was sort of a, a little bit of a collaborative project with my friend. Um, so this one right here, this is a map of the United States, and it's a map of monarch butterfly migration by generation. And so something that I learned from a friend of mine recently is that uh, I knew that, that monarchs came down here to Mexico and they got all the way up to Canada, but I didn't realize that it actually takes them three generations of butterfly to go from south to north. And so if I tilt this a little different way, the first generation is indicated by the red lights down here. So the first generation gets from their roosting spot to um, like northern Mexico. The second generation gets to like southeast United States. And the third generation gets up to Canada. And then a fourth generation goes all the way back down and roosts. So I just found that to be fascinating. So that one LED hack that I showed you guys of cutting an X, that's what I used going up there. Now. Another thing that I added to this project, we didn't get a chance to talk about sensors, but I changed the capability of this so that I made a sensor that goes with this as well, that dial sensor that I showed you. So if I put it here, I've made it track also the time of year. See how it says March, April, May, June, July. So as I turn the dial sensor, there's the first generation. Here's about where they are in May. <coughs> And it goes to the second generation, that's in like June and July in the Southeast United States. And then that third generation is in like that August time frame. And then if I had another color of light or if I had tri-LEDs, I might make it go all the way around and say, all right, from, you know, from uh, September to November, that's when they fly back down and that's the fourth generation that goes back down. But you can track the time of year that you'll find these butterflies. So I did a little bit of my own research I kind of smushed together stuff from about three different sources to make exactly what I wanted to make. But this is just LEDs and a sensor. So my whole theory and BirdBrain's whole theory on um, being able to program and being able to make stuff is that you shouldn't have to know everything to do something, to do something that you're interested in. Whether it's a social studies class like this, a science class, a robot poetry project, a robot Shakespeare project. So let's take a look at what you could do with that. I love that example that you just shared because I think the dial sensor for teachers that we've worked with, that's been the hardest one to translate. Like how or yeah, really what should I be doing with it? 
Yes. How can I make that interesting? Time of year. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's really cool. Thanks. I I was very proud of it. <laughs> As you should. That was a good day at work, right there. <laughs> yeah. Things like uh, program the Harry Potter theme song for when he's in a different mode. My Harry Potter little bot plays the Harry Potter theme song, so it's a good day at work. Um, but let me switch over here and tell you how to find all of these things that I've been talking about. Um, so if you go to birdbraintechnologies.com, if you go to our robots, that'll give you kind of an overview of what a hummingbird is or what a finch is. A finch is this little white robot over here, which we're not really going to talk about very much today. But if you go to get started, here's where all of our learning materials exist online for free. So this is where you're first going to choose your robot. So we've been talking about the hummingbird bit. This is where you can choose your device. So I was working on an iPad, but you can see you can pick Chromebook, Mac, Windows, etc. Excuse me, etc. So I'm going to pick iPad. And you'll see that when you pick iPad, the only option is Bird Blocks. It's that free app. But if I changed my mind, if I said instead Windows, you could see that works with MakeCode, Snap, Python, or Java. Same thing for a Mac. Um, so I'm going to switch back over to iPad. I'm going to say Bird Blocks. And now I go to Get Started. And what that portal does is it filters out all of the information you don't need to know. You don't need to know things about the Bluetooth dongle or the tethering this or the downloading that. Nope, you don't need to know it, especially in this program tab. It just gives you the information you need to know. So it unlocks these four tabs, program, build, teach, and resources. Let's take a look at program. This teaches you basically what I just taught you on the iPad. It teaches you in a very modular and non-sequential way how to program the pieces of your hummingbird. So the first step is set up. So we've got these little video tutorials here that will teach you how they'll get you the app on your device. They'll teach you how to get your, your hummingbird into Bluetooth mode, all that stuff. There's seven steps to get you set up to do it. And then let's take a look at single color LED. There's seven videos in here that will teach you how to turn on your LED like we did and how to blink it. And something I love that Matt did um, in these videos, Matt, my coworker Matt, is he also showed you a little project that you could do with just that component. So with your red and yellow and green lights, you can make a cool little traffic light. There's another example that's active volcanoes in Hawaii. Yeah. Got some pretty active ones earlier this year, as I understand. Um, I think this is like our favorite new thing that you guys have added to the website. Like thanks. total props to Matt on, Matt on that because those videos, like <laughs> being silent and showing you and you're so focused and they're very mm -hmm. clear. It is easy for anyone to understand what you need to be doing. And we found that these are used in a number of ways. So there is text over here explaining what's going on in the video, if that's helpful. And if you go up here and select the print button, you'll get a still shot of the video with the text next to it. So you can totally print it out and put it in a binder if that's what you need for your classroom. But you could also, you could show these videos up front in the classroom. You could have students log on to hear themselves and teach themselves how to do coding. But you'll see as you click through these videos, we'll show you how to plug that component in, just like I showed you how to use the little tool push down the button, we'll show you which blocks you need to drag out, just like I did, um, how to program that thing. And then one of my favorite things, we have this side-by-side -side run video, so you can see the code with a little arrow, just like I did with my finger, showing you what that code looks like running. And then the last one in each of these little modules is a challenge. So how could you get your light to blink faster? We did that by changing the decimal on there. And so there's a module for each component that the hummingbird has. A uh, single LED and position servo, we just did those modules. Um, when we say module, sometimes people think like, oh, it's an eight week module. Nah, it's a five minute module, right? In five minutes, you can be blinking a light. In five minutes, you can be using a motor and you can follow along with video. An unintended benefit that we found is that these are also really good for pre-readers, for mm -hmm. ESL learners, for deaf students, we had a teacher email us and tell us that they really appreciated how their uh, deaf students are often a little bit behind because um, it takes them a little longer to acquire language. And so they loved these videos because they didn't have to listen and they didn't have to read. They could follow along and program at their own pace. Um, and we've also got a, mo a module for each of the different kinds of inputs, which obviously we didn't get to today either. So there's all those programming modules to teach you how to program your hummingbird. So then we can get into build. So I showed you some things from the build today, um, but the joy of Hummingbird, and sometimes for teachers, the challenge of Hummingbird is that it's not just about programming, it's about physical engineering too, which
which I think is what makes it really cross, uh, cross curricular, collaborative, interesting. That's what makes me really excited. But for some teachers, it's funny, some of them are really intimidated by the coding part of it. Some of them are very int intimidated by my craft supplies. It's, it's fun. Um, uh, Okay, good. Um, it's fun just kind of seeing seeing what different teachers are, are comfortable with. But we've got some basic mechanisms here. See that cable system mechanism on there? Now is the time that I promised. We'll take a look inside <laughs> my robot. So this is a cable system. It's using friendship bracelet string, like I talked about, and some straws. Tied the straw around the top here. We've got some elastic on the back because the cardboard gets kind of tired after a while. But inside, you can see the motors. Oops. I, uh, I just hot glued some craft sticks onto the motors to increase the radius a little bit. The craft sticks are pulling on the string, the string is pulling down on the straw, and now you've got a cable mechanism. And so we don't tell you, hey, make a hand with this cable mechanism. You, we show you how to make one, and then you decide, do you wanna duplicate it four times and make a hand? Do you wanna be making a robot petting zoo animal and make a giraffe's neck or a swan's wing? What do you wanna do with that mechanism it's not just about the coding. What do you want to do with your code, right? There you go. That is my email. <laughs> <laughs> oh, on build, we've got your basic mechanisms there. We've got some cool, simple robots. One of my favorite, I've got a bunch of favorites, actually. The Bee Waggle one, this one has a lesson plan that goes with it. Say that again so the microphone can hear me. This one has a really cool lesson plan that goes with it. So if you're not sure what to, what to teach on that very first day in your classroom, there's a lesson plan we're gonna see in the resources section that teaches you how to build this little, little styrofoam bee. You could probably figure out how to build it actually, it's really simple. But you get to watch a video about how bees communicate by wiggling back and forth about the location and distances of nectar sources. And so you program your bee to also do a bee waggle dance. It's narrated by David Attenborough, who should just narrate my life. And <laughs> so we have a little build video for that. But I actually, I love the tiny drummer. I'll go in here and show you this one. This one is so funny for students. Because there he is. He's drums on a cup with a popsicle stick. He's delightful. Um, so in this video, Matt shows you like what craft supplies you need, right? Quickly how to build it. But one of the things that I like to do, I love for this to be a first project after they learn lights and motors. And then I tell them, pick your favorite song. Now, kids may not have a favorite code, right? But every kid has a favorite song. So pick your favorite song and sync it up, sync the drum beat up to your favorite song and make it your own. Do you want to make it have like a drum kit? Do you want it to be sort of like a, like from Moana, like a djembe drummer or something like that? What do you want your drummer to do and what do you want it to look like? And so I love this project. And if you follow us on Twitter um, at Birdbrain Tech or me at Kelsey Connects, um, I'm always posting pictures of what teachers are doing in um, my workshops and I do Chinese drummer a lot. I've gotten Childish Gambino, I've gotten Eye of the Tiger, I've gotten <laughs> White Stripes and Michael Jackson, all different kinds of funky little drummers. What about the Phil Collins Break It Down one? Oh, that would be great. Be real good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, do it, do it. <laughs> we have some hummingbird hacks, some of our favorite tools, some ways to work with cardboard, some ways to attach hummingbird components. That little X hack that I showed you for mounting an LED is in there. So that's our build page. And then let's look at the teach page. This is where it really seems to open up for teachers and what really, what really gets them. So on this page, we have over 60 different projects from actual classrooms, from actual teachers of what they've done with Hummingbird. So um, modeling joints is on here. I've talked about robot petting zoo a little bit. That protractor activity is on here. All kinds of really cool things. I have a teacher that's gonna be doing pinball. He just, I had a video chat with him today. He's really excited about that. I want to look at Robot Shakespeare, though, because I think this is a great example of a cross-curricular um, robotics connection. So before I show you the video of student work, looking inside here, you see we've got the teacher's objectives and learning goals. We've got this aligned to standards. Now, some of those are computer science standards, but if you go in here, a bunch of these are ELA standards. She was hitting her ELA standards, teaching about Shakespeare, uh, uh, diving into that text through creative robotics. She's also got her lesson procedures in here. She's even got videos of her students' assessments, of them doing their verbal assessments with her. But let's take a look at this video just briefly. There we go, yes, that way. Okay, 
So these were eighth graders re reading Romeo and Juliet, and they had to um, record their voices, reading the scene, and sync it up with their shoebox project. The kid's my favorite. <laughs> I love that one too, actually, because they say, oh, look, here comes my nurse, and then the nurse kind of pops in. It's kind of funny, which is appropriate, because the nurse is the comedic relief of that show. They're showing that they understood so much, and even more than they could do in just building a diorama, they're, they're activating it, they're reading, they're speaking. These are, I mean, all of these different ELA goals, they're hitting in a really deep and meaningful way by teaching through creative robotics. So that's our teach page. And then, so we've got program build, teach, and then resources, if I zoom out one more time. Um, this resources page is, is my baby a little bit. These are all kinds of printable instructional resources for teachers to use in the classroom. So I talked about that lesson plan, the B Waggle lesson plan. That's the first hour of robotics lesson plan. So it's not only for students who are learning their first hour of robotics, it's really for that teacher who's teaching robotics for the first time, for the first hour of their careers. What can I reasonably do in an hour? You can do a light and a motor and make a small project in an hour. Totally reasonable to do. And we lead you through how to do that and we give you some like example code and cheat code for two different versions of your Be Waggle Challenge. We've got assessment guides about computational thinking and um, engineering design, definitely check those out. And we've also got these coding cards, um, which I have an example, let me grab it real quick. And are fantastic. Yes. Yeah. I really, really like them. So for example, this, these are the coding cards with bird blocks. Let me switch this over. Um, the coding cards have, uh, they're two-sided and you can print them out yourself, you know, print them in color, double-sided, cut them in half, laminate them, put them on a key ring because, you know, that's how we do as teachers. And on the front side, it tells you how and where to plug in that component, the single color LED. And on the back, it gives you example code for how to code it and then gives you a little challenge. Write a program that makes the LED blink faster. You have the same thing for a tricolor LED, for a motor, for a sensor, etc. So I would love to print these out. And when I travel, I'll often print a set of these out and just keep them in the kit keep them all together so that you could set those up as stations around your room, you could keep them with a the kit like that. But those are our four types of resources, program, build, teach, and resources. And I've linked all of those in the Google Doc as well. Um, I know we're just barely at the end of our time here, but what do you do with all of this information? There's a couple great things to do, and I put this at the bottom of the Google Doc. So I'll go back here. There you go. Um, let me zoom down here a little bit. Um, if you're interested in, um, uh, in working with the Grantwood AEA, they've been working with hummingbirds for a while, and as, um, as Amber mentioned, they're like very into it. So if you're in their service area, definitely contact Ander, um, Amber and Corey. Um, they can help support you in your classroom. They can give you some one-on-one -on -one help, help you through launching a project. They have all kinds of services there, so definitely contact them. Or you can contact me um, at BirdBrain. I have my email there as well, as well. And one of the really cool things that we can do for you is we can send you a kit. We can mail these to you for two months so that you can try it out in your classroom. You can try it out in whatever program you're interested in. I can mail you one of these. So just email me and say, hey, can you mail me a kit? Yes, yes, I can. Um, and uh, also, if you're interested in professional development, either doing something in person for yourself, your school, your district, um, I can fly out to go do those things. Please fly me home to Iowa. I would not mind seeing my mother a little bit more. That would be great. Um, or we can also use this webinar studio, um, which has some really cool benefits like people videoing in from multiple places. And let's say each of you had a kit in front of you and I had a kit in front of me, I could be programming here and you could say, wait, wait, hold on, my, my light doesn't work. And we can set it up so that we can all see each other as well. And I can say, wait, show me what you, oh, your wires are backwards, just switch those. Now you got it, hey, you got your light blinking, way to go, <laughs> right? Um, so you can also contact me about professional development and things like that. Or 
I'm also going to be, and so are Amber and Corey, going to be at a conference in Des Moines next month. It's the iTech conference. Um, and there's gonna be a couple of events that happen through that conference. So we'll email those out. One of the really fun ones though I wanna show you is called Bots and Bevs. So excited. <laughs> so Bots and Bevs event, Amber and, and Corey are gonna be there as well. What I do is I bring my robots to usually a brewery. I'm gonna be at the Iowa Tap Room. Um, and we're gonna sort of just take up as many tables as we can. <laughs> and uh, you buy your own alcohol and food, but I bring my robots and I bring my craft supplies in these little like six pack holders. And then you make stuff, grab a beer with your friends. You don't have to go to the conference to come to these Bots and Bevs events. There's, <clears throat> and there's actually two. There's one that I'm doing in West Des Moines at Fox Brewing Company in Valley Junction. Um, the, like the third, the Friday, the Thursday or Friday before the conference. And then there's one that I'm doing at the conference as well. So we'll send you links. Um, you, since you guys registered through us, we'll send you links to both of those events, but I'll be bringing my kits. You could totally get hands on and do some cool stuff with bots and bevs, um, at a bots and bevs, get to know us, you know, meet us a little bit and like build something, share a beer. It'll be great. Um, so love to see you guys at bots and bevs as well. So couple of couple of things if you're interested in borrowing a kit professional development seeing me while I'm in Iowa I'm actually gonna be there for about 10 days just visiting family and whatnot but I can totally come to you wherever you are in the state or video with you um, I'll send you those things um, come to a bots and bevs or talk to Amber and Corey about um, hooking up with the Grantwood AEA and seeing what services they can offer you um, I'm going to give a quick shout out next month in our makerspace YouTube show, we're going to be featuring hummingbird and students actually using hummingbird. So if you're still not quite sold on how could kids do this, we're going to be featuring a fourth grade class um, going through that process and some of the things that they learned along the way with some of their struggles. And so definitely keep an eye out for that. We are going to launch that on October 1st. So that is awesome. That is very, very cool. It's, uh, I've taught a couple of workshops that have both teachers and students, <coughs> excuse me, in the room at the same time. And it's actually just so powerful to see kids doing this thing. And sometimes teachers will be like, well, if it's hard for me, it's gonna be really hard for them. No, if it's hard for you, it's gonna be way easier for them. They're actually, they are digital natives. They are native tablet users. I don't know if anyone else has had this experience, but my, my friend's three-year-old just did this to a physical picture the other day. Like they tried to zoom in on an actual photograph. <laughs> uh -huh. I was like, no, no, buddy, that's not how those work. <laughs> um, but I can stick for, um, I can stick around for a little bit. If anybody wants to ask questions in that chat window over there, um, feel free to, and I can answer any questions that you guys have. Um, I can also do a demo of our brand new Finch if anybody wants to see that. But looks like, um, can you share the link to your YouTube channel? Yeah, I bet Matt can do that actually. Matt. Uh, does a lot of things on our YouTube channel, so can you share that? Oh, oh, the Think, Make, Innovate. Uh, yeah, do you guys want to talk about your your um, Grant Wood? Because uh, you guys have been doing YouTube videos and stuff, right? Right, yeah, so that was just kind of what I was chatting or sharing there. That's what I thought she was asking. Maybe she was not asking that, but um, yeah, so Think, Make, Innovate, we launch one challenge every month uh, at the beginning of it, and we invite people to send back uh, or tag us when they share out on social media when they complete the challenge with their students, but we give a little intro and then showcase an area school students making and going through the process. So we're very, very excited uh, that the, our area teachers are getting more and more comfortable with tools like Hummingbird to be able to showcase the potential of that because it is so cool of all of the different things that you can do. Very cool. Those, those Think, Make, Innovate um, videos are just awesome. You guys, did you just put out your first one or was that the... No, so it's been, uh, this is actually our fifth year. Um, we've done, I know, <laughs> we have done uh, five or uh, five years, and this will be the second time we featured Hummingbird. Um, the first time we did the duo with a group where we just did a uh, cardboard um, animatronics basically of like them moving wings and the process that, that they went through those uh, they were in a middle or a junior high. Wow, those kids like. I, they were, they, when I went in, the teacher told me they had tapped out on doing code.org. They had tapped out on Scratch. They're like, we're old enough that we can do other programming. And yes, I do believe that. But when they got in there, like, this is challenging. This re-engages this for me. And this gives me a new way to kind of think about things. And yeah. a few of those kids thought they could set the world on fire after that. So that yeah. was really cool. 
that's something when we talk about that like low floor high ceiling that the the low floor can apply to the coating like it's really easy to blink a light but the high ceiling in terms of coating there are all kinds of like math blocks you can get into variables you can call a function you can do things with lists like the 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 more interesting you get with the math of it the weirder your robot's going to be it's going to be great so um when we talk about that low floor high ceiling um that can really apply to the coding it can apply to the building you can make something that is a fairly low floor like my ogre here um or something that has a uh, is more towards the higher end of the ceiling like my owl it's actually the owl has eyes it's got a head it's got a wing it's got some sensors and stuff on it too um so that low floor can apply to the coding but to the building as well and there's another concept so mitch resnick who um, is one of the inventors of scratch um, he talks about low floor, high ceiling for scratch, but he also, he's expanded that now to talk about wide walls in terms of, well, what can you do with it? Can you just teach math? Can you just teach social studies? With this thing, you can kind of teach whatever you want to teach with it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we loved, and in our workshop, we did the robot poetry, and I think that was a huge so sell cool. yeah. for yeah. everyone to really think, and I love that you said that you were uh, an English teacher, because I think that that's like the hardest sell to connect coding and robotics to, but I, we had all sorts of warm and fuzzies because our participants actually like read the poems that they were inspired by for their creation, yeah, and cool. it was so amazing, the things that they created. Yes. And we had books for them, and resources, and like one of the woman was like, no, I have a favorite poem. I'm good. <laughs> you go. <laughs> great. Get it. Yeah. Get it. That's great. Yeah, that's one of my favorite projects to do with teachers because I think um, it's a little bit like like robot or like educational yoga, bringing like robotics and coding and poetry together, making these two things that feel very disparate and, and separate touch, you know, is a really a powerful thing to do. Um, powerful thing to do for teachers to show that like, actually these things aren't that different, right? These things are, are compatible um, in an important way. Something I didn't go over earlier is we, we usually recommend Hummingbird for about third or fourth grade and up. Um, and we recommend that between two and like four students work together on a project. So if you're doing something more kind of simple, you might have two students on it, more kind of simple like a bee waggle, two students doing it. Um, but if you're doing something more complex, maybe three or four or, if you're in an after school program and not everybody comes every time, maybe even five kids in a group. Um, you know, if you're doing something more complicated, like the map project took me a couple hours to do, um, doing something like the owl or a robot petting zoo, you can kind of start to get a feel for that. But we definitely recommend that multiple students work together in a group for a couple of reasons. The first one is that um, research tells us that pair programming is the best way to learn programming actually because they're not just engaging in the screen they're also talking about it and so they're also like encoding what they're doing through their language centers of their brain and so they're saying wait what block are we supposed to use wait what number do we put in there and by talking that out they're actually learning it more deeply as well um, and also it gives it it gives students a, a chance to meaningfully collaborate and work on some of those 21st century skills as well because like maybe there's a student who's like really into the coding maybe there's a student that really has these skills these crafty skills and that's what they can bring to the group so it helps them do that more organically too yeah and what i think is super cool is that you have multiple ports right so even if you have a group of four you can have a group of four here and a group of four here all working on the same board if you don't have many of them in your classroom with that project that we'll be coming out with the fourth graders was a huge class of like almost 30 and so there were like four or five boards in the room and we made it work and the kids really showed kind of how they could collaborate and use materials in different ways that's great that's super great thank you all so much for joining us if nobody has else has any questions we will um kind of end the video chat here we'll send you a recording since you guys registered through through us we'll send you a recording of this probably in the next day or so um so that you will have a, a recording of it uh, of everything we did here today and make sure to if you're interested in receiving a kit talking about professional development talking to Grantwood AEA make sure you reach out to us because we just we would love to hear from you so thanks so much for joining us in our live stream learning studio and thank you so much to Amber and Corey for um, helping us put this on and reaching your people as well yeah thank thanks you for, thanks for inviting us <laughs> super <Absolutely>. fun <laughs> woohoo thanks everybody Woo.